not a guess here. Sorry. You can adopt that. <laughs> Go ahead, Tom. Okay. Our guest speaker today is uh, Dr. Robert J. Shield. Uh, with him is his son, Robert, and his wife, Rose. They want to come in and hear the present presentation. I'm sure they've heard it before, but they want to join us and, and, and get to meet us. So we're glad to have all of you with us today. Now, Dr. Shield, I've only met him on the, on the, on the phone and we've exchanged emails, but I hadn't met him before, but Dina recommended him and said he'd be a very interesting speaker. Now, Yay. come on in, Mario. And uh, all of you know about the kingdom that's on the corner of Homestead and 160. And the Italian restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, I think people read in the newspaper it's been sold. They didn't know a lot about it. You hear bits and pieces of what's going on. Instead of hearing rumors and comments, I want to hear from the person himself. So he could tell us about the kingdom, what it's going to be used for, and how he's going to do it. And that's Dr. Peter J. Steele. Dr. Steele? Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Uh, your president, your special guests. And, um, I uh, have traveled the world studying and investigating the strange and the unusual for the best part of, what, 85 years now. Um, the kingdom was something we came across quite by accident. Uh, um, for the last three years, I've owned a, an antique mall in Las Vegas, uh, in the Boulevard Mall. But for any of you who may know the history of the Boulevard Mall, it has recently uh, gone through a very tough period of semi-demise and uh, we were seeing approximately seven people a day walking past our door. So I figured it was about time to make a move and I, uh, quite by chance, as life has it, uh, ran into the owners of the, or the new owners I should say, of the kingdom who purchased it three and a half years ago with the intention of knocking it down and building a uh, a retail complex on that location. Um, after some discussion, uh, they were kind enough to agree to allow me to have the building for the next couple of years, uh, and we have some rather interesting and uh, I hope entertaining plans for it, which I'll share with you at the end of my presentation. Um, I thought rather than just bore you to death with what we're going to do with the, um, uh, with the kingdom, uh, I'd spend a few minutes giving you an insight into the sort of things that I've done over the last few years. Um, and it's interesting, Tom, when you mentioned that my son and my wife had seen this presentation before. Uh, as a matter of fact, they haven't. This is what I put together just for you. Um, so what I might ask is that we dim the lights and we can uh, uh, hope that you can see the screen behind you. You might even get a better view on the little computer beside me here. Um, if you swing around, whichever suits you best, um, and we'll take it from there. Um, this is not, incidentally, my first uh, encounter with the Rotary. Um, I was very privileged to be involved with the Rotary Club in North Sydney uh, back in 1988. Uh, the year was the bicentennial of Australia, and we had a special occasion where a, a fleet of tall ships, you may recall, sailed from England. They took a year to reach the shores of Sydney uh, in commemoration of the first ever uh, arrivals on the island. And I got the wild idea uh, when approached by the Rotary to assist them in raising funds for the Polio Plus uh, campaign that was going back at that time. Um, uh, I talked um, Qantas Airlines into giving me a jumbo jet and uh, through the facilities of the radio program that I was hosting at the time, uh, I managed to sell the 300 seats on the jet to corporate sponsors, and uh, then in turn we allocated those seats to underprivileged and handicapped children. So on the arrival of the fleet, uh, we flew circles over the fleet as it came into Sydney Harbour. Uh, not only was it the most rewarding and lifetime experience for those children, but we raised thirty-five thousand dollars for the uh, for the Rotary benefit. So uh, I was very privileged to be part of that. Um, my life has been uh, very varied over the years. Um, 
I've lived in 225 cities uh, in 25 countries, uh, according to TripAdvisor. Um, my World of Unexplained Mysteries radio and television series has been seen and heard around the world uh, through the Odyssey Network across Europe for the BBC and across 47 stations in Australia, where I was privileged to spend oh, 25, nearly 30 years. Um, my son Robert, who will be managing the kingdom, by the way, uh, was, uh, um, considers Australia his home. Um, I, uh, I went to the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, um, initially with Associated Press, and then eventually joined Cambridge University's archaeological team there, under the uh, head of Dr. David Trump, and uh, worked on the island for five years. Uh, some considerable number of years later, the very last thing I excavated from the island was my wife Rose. <laughs> uh, but uh, Rose is wife number seven, and I want to let you know that seven is the lucky number. Um, so uh, we've all uh, we've all travelled, uh, but that will just give you an idea of the area of this planet. Uh, I think it's estimated to be about 20% of the planet that I've had the privilege of visiting uh, over the years. Um, I must tell you this little story. Um, circumstances uh, move in very strange ways. Uh, I walked into, I came to, to Las Vegas in 1990, intending to retire here, and I won't bore you with that story. But uh, some years later, in fact in uh, 2007, I walked into my local casino, which was Joker's Wild on Boulder Highway in Las Vegas, uh, was sitting at my favorite slot machine and suddenly heard my name called. Uh, I got up to see what it was all about and it appeared that my name had been uh, drawn out of a drum along with five other people and were now eligible to win a car. Uh, as my name was the first one drawn, I got the first opportunity to try my key and needless to say, it opened the door. So I, uh, I won the car that you see in the picture here. And the reason I tell you that story is because even though I had worked as an archaeologist on a number of locations around the world, including China and the Mediterranean, Cyprus, uh, I had never had the opportunity to fulfill my number one item on my bucket list. And the funds from the sale of the car, because I took the cash rather than the car, provided me with that opportunity. Uh, an incredible journey uh, to the land of Egypt. Uh, and if you haven't visited Egypt, it's probably not the right time of the year to go or the right uh, um, environment at the moment, but it's a must. Um, uh, it's one of the most exciting um, trips of my lifetime. Uh, I wanted to go to Egypt for two reasons. For some uh, 20 odd years now, I've been involved into the investigative study of the Shroud of Turin. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Shroud. Uh, most Christians believe it to be the burial cloth in which Christ was wrapped following the crucifixion. And for um, a substantial number of years now, various teams around the world have studied and investigated the authenticity of the cloth. Um, a group called the Stirp Group out of the US uh, in the 70s went to visit the shroud and carried out uh, massive tests not to identify whether or not the shroud was the burial cloth of Christ but more importantly how did that mysterious negative image appear on the cloth? What was the cause of the image? Most of them went there quite convinced that they were going to come back having discovered that it was simply a painting. Um, at the end of their investigative studies, and these are the top scientists in the world, they had absolutely no answer as to how that image got onto the cloth, a reverse image. If you have an opportunity to visit us at the Kingdom uh, once a month, uh, uh, I intend to present one of my lectures. I lecture now for the Smithsonian Institute, and one of my lectures is on the Shroud, and I'd love to have you come along. Uh, my most recent book, and I have nine at the moment, um, is on the Shroud of Turin, and I'll tell you about that at the end of our presentation today. Um, what's so important about Egypt and the Shroud is uh, right here at the very tip of the Red Sea, uh, just here in uh, on the Sinai Desert, 
is a monastery known as St. Catherine's. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about St. Catherine's because very few people know about it, but for um, shroud aficionados, it's the penultimate. It's where 90% of the icons that have images of picture, pictures of what was believed to be the face of Christ exist. Um, we, in fact, for our visit, stayed here right at the head of the uh, Red Sea at a place called Taba Heights and journeyed both from here to um, uh, uh, Sinai, to Cairo, and ultimately to Jordan, which I'll show you about in a moment or two. Um, the, uh, in, the, in 1988, just to conclude the Shroud story quickly, uh, three major universities around the world carried out carbon dating on the Shroud. Many of you may have heard that it was then proved to be um, a 14th century cloth as opposed to a 1st century cloth, which it would have had to have been if it had actually wrapped Christ. Those, uh, those investigative studies have now proved to have been false. Um, the Los Alamos Laboratory here in the U.S. discovered that the piece of cloth that was identified and, and carbon dated was in fact cotton, where any of us who are involved with the shroud know that the shroud is made of linen. Uh, and it appears that what was actually carbon dated was in fact a piece of mend carried out by the nuns at the time that the shroud was involved in a fire. But I won't bore you with all that today. Um, our trip to Egypt was remarkable. Uh, has anybody here visited the pyramids? Have any of you had the opportunity to visit Egypt? It is one of the most remarkable things you'll ever see. This picture, I think, is more, uh, perhaps best uh, descriptive of, of just how massive those pyramids are. Rose and I, you will see, stood up there in the middle on a two and a half ton block, and we're uh, insignificant alongside it. Um, in my world of unexplained mysteries, uh, the pyramids rate very highly, needless to say. Um, uh, to this day, it remains one of the most unexplained mysteries of the world, despite what you may read uh, about them, pulling them up on sleds and everything else. Um, consider this, if 20,000 workmen raise 10 of those two and a half ton blocks a day, it would have taken 30 generations just to build the Cheops pyramid. A total of something like 664 years. My, uh, my favorite lecture, uh, and will be the first one that I'll be presenting, is uh, a look at alien intervention on archeological sites. It's a bit of a tongue in cheek look at the very uh, remarkable feats that were carried out in those uh, ancient days that we have no explanation for to this day. How these stones were moved, uh, how various things happened and took place. And uh, that all forms part of, of uh, my Smithsonian uh, lecture. Um, this is the monastery at St. Catherine's. Um, forgive me because my memory is not the greatest, so I uh, I'll rely on some notes. But the monastery uh, was actually created in uh, 570, uh, 579 um, AD, uh, and uh, was uh, um, looked after by Constantine. And then ultimately, it was the uh, it was the um, uh, uh, sheikh uh, of, uh, of Qatar that took over the responsibility of refurbishing the monastery. It is right at the foot of the mountain where Moses is said to have received the stone tablets. And it's built on the location where the burning bush was said to have been uh, uh, located. And in fact, the bush, if you want to believe it, still remains there to this day to be touched. Um, and, uh, and Rose enjoyed that, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but the monastery is located uh, right here in the lower section of, uh, of the peninsula. Um, and uh, is about a one-day uh, bus journey from, uh, from Tabor Heights, where we were located. Uh, First-class coaches, of course. At the time that we were there, back in 2007, um, the security was still a problem. We had armed guards everywhere, but we really had no problems. We thoroughly enjoyed our visit. Uh, as we drove out across the desert, of course, you encounter the nomad people of the desert, um, uh, the Bedouin, and they really are a remarkable people. 
um, living as they do uh, in, in the heart of the desert, in the wilderness, they're extremely <coughs> friendly and, and, and an awful lot of fun. And I apologize that you can't really uh, get the full benefit of these pictures. Uh, in fact, I thought you'll even be able to see this, but this is a rather interesting item they show us. Uh, this is supposed to be the stone calf. You remember the golden calf that was turned to stone uh, in Moses' day? Well, this image of a calf, perfectly natural in the stone, still remains on that location to this day. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's fascinating. You can perhaps see it better on the little screen here. Um, Shopping was not a problem. <laughs> it seems no matter where you go in the world, no matter how remote or how unique the location, somebody manages to set up store. Uh, but what fascinated me and was the most intriguing aspect of it all was if you look to the bottom left-hand corner, there's an ATM. <laughs> Smack in the middle of the Sinai Desert. <laughs> no opportunity was missed. Um, so we traveled, of course, into the monastery, and as I said, it, it's fascinating. It, the refurbishing was completed in 2007. Um, uh, the building itself is massive, as you can see, the uh, surrounds of the, uh, of the monastery. Uh, entry into the monastery initially was uh, by a lift going up to this location here. Uh, today, you go in through a small entranceway here, and even then, when they put that entranceway in there, um, they used to use these locations to pour burning oil on any intruders which they felt shouldn't be uh, attacking the castle uh, or the fortress. But it has the largest collection of religious icons anywhere in the world, superior even to those in the Vatican, uh, and really is remarkable. The bush you see to the right, you'll see a little better picture of it in a minute, um, is the burning bush. Uh, if you uh, feel energetic, and I must confess we didn't, you can climb the side of the mountain here, either by camel or on foot, uh, and travel up to the top of the mountain where Moses, of course, was the top. Um, here is the bush, and there's my rose gazing up in awe. Uh, wow. Uh, this, for me, was the favorite. Uh, this is called Skull House. Uh, they have a unique burial tradition inside the monastery. Um, you can't really see inside from there, but you might get a glimpse of the skulls behind the chicken wire in this picture. You might see them a little better on the smaller screen. But all the deceased monks from the monastery, their skulls are all accumulated and saved behind this chicken wire fence. And at the other end of the, uh, of the skull house, uh, down at the bottom, which again you can barely see there, perhaps a little better here, are the, the, rest, of the rest of the remains of their their bones. Um, the hierarchy uh, are contained in cupboards on the side of the uh, uh, skull house, but a fascinating tradition that I hadn't seen anywhere else. This is the most famous icon from, uh, from the monastery. Um, the icon is the uh, Christ the Pancrator, um, and it is the closest resemblance to the actual image on the, on the, uh, on the cloth. Uh, this is a uh, 3D image uh, taken by the uh, NASA's uh, image analyzer of the actual face on the cloth. And if you have the opportunity to call by um, the kingdom, uh, I have it in, uh, in bronze, but it really is uh, quite a remarkable uh, work. Um, so St. Catherine's was undoubtedly the highlight of our journey. On our way back to our hotel, we stopped at an oasis and suddenly these two beautiful little Bedouin children just literally appeared out of nowhere. We don't know where they came from or where they eventually went to. They just appeared, stole our lunch boxes, <laughs> and, we, we came, uh, uh, and, and uh, took off again. But they were really uh, beautiful young children. Uh, you're late, ma'am. Did you bring a note? <laughs> Can you hear me okay at the back of the Yes. The reason I asked that I was doing a seminar like this a few months ago, and there was a lady sat right where you are at the back, and, I'd been going for about 20 minutes, and she got up and she said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've been sitting here for 20 minutes and I haven't heard a word you said. <laughs> oh, no. There was a gentleman right down the front where you are, sir, uh, kind of got to his feet. He said, I've been down the front for 20 minutes. I've heard every word you said, and I'll gladly change places with the lady. <laughs> It'll give you some idea of what you're in store for. Um, this is the crossing of the Red Sea. Um, 
uh, where Moses is said to have crossed. Um, and artifacts have been pulled from beneath the waves of uh, uh, chariot wheels and weapons dating to that period. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of archaeological support for most of our biblical history. Uh, the Tava Heights Resort is where we stayed, uh, and the one in the lower right-hand corner is in fact in Jordan. It's uh, the uh, Marriott of Petra. Um, we uh, uh, couldn't leave the area without visiting Jordan and Petra. Again, it's a one-day trip from Tava Heights, which was a good central location. Uh, very few people know much about the lost city of Petra. <coughs> Discovered in 1812, um, Burkhardt, interestingly enough, who discovered it, uh, started out in Malta, of all strange coincidences. Um, at that time, uh, Malta was occupied primarily by Egyptians. Uh, it's been occupied by every known race, uh, I think, uh, that has visited our civilization. But uh, uh, he, he stayed there uh, until uh, his departure for Egypt, uh, learning the Egyptian language, and then disguised himself as an Egyptian so that he could travel uh, um, uninterrupted uh, throughout the region. And uh, he was the man who, in fact, discovered uh, the, uh, the lost city. It hadn't been seen by uh, Westerners for over a thousand years. And uh, again, it is one of the most remarkable places you could ever have the opportunity to visit. Um, you have a number of choices. You can climb into a little wagon like you can see up there at the right hand corner, a horse drawn, or you can rent a horse, or you can do as we chose to do, uh, regretfully, uh, and that's to walk. Uh, we, uh, we were under the impression it was about a 10 or 15 minute walk. Well, about an hour and 10 minutes later, uh, we actually arrived at Petra. Um, the journey is quite remarkable and, and well worth walking. Um, uh, we did take the car back, by the way. Uh, but uh, uh, you can quite imagine why it remained hidden for that thousand years uh, as you go through these incredible crevices. What the, uh, what the Nabataeans uh, were most known for uh, and that's literally all we know about Petra is the name of the people who lived there, the Nabataeans, uh, is their remarkable ability to control irrigation. They built canals, which you'll see, um, and aqueducts uh, leading in through these, uh, these canyons, uh, which kept them alive uh, for, uh, for several generations. Um, there's an extremely good picture here where you can see the aqueduct on the left of the path. Uh, the paving that you see was a later Roman edition, um, but uh, absolutely amazing. And as you walk through this last final gap, you're met with the uh, incredible view uh, of, uh, of Petra. What's the weather like there? It was, uh, we were there in December and it was very hot. No, over there it was cold. You were cold? Yeah. Oh. You see me wrapped up. <laughs> I stand correct. Um, but uh, for me, Petra is still an amazing mystery because if you note uh, the way the place is built, um, the Nabataeans, as far as we know, were traders. They worked the trade routes, um, uh, but they were amazing in the, in the sense that they were able to build these canals and aqueducts and dams system which collected the excessive rain, rain from, the, uh, from the heavy summer uh, rains that they experienced. Um, but what happens to, happened to Petra, how it, how it reached its demise, to this day we don't know. We believe that it was possibly a Persian invasion. Yes ma'am. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, please. Um, I just wanted to remind you that many of our guests have to go to work. Oh, right. So, and we want to have some time for questions for you. Okay. So let me fly quickly through this. Thank you for bringing me to that. Um, I'll fly quickly through the last of these slides. But to my <coughs> way of thinking, people who lived in caves, as these people apparently did, to be able to produce a master sculpture of this magnitude, uh, of this beauty, is totally beyond my wildest imagination or, or ability to explain. These are the caves they lived in. We met with them. We actually met a, a gentleman, a Bedouin, who married an American tourist. Uh, 
uh, uh, we have the book of her life story. Um, but Petra is well worth your time to visit and, and uh, is one of the most remarkable sites in the world um, that we thoroughly enjoyed. Um, Tabor Heights, again, a very beautiful place to visit, a remarkable location for a holiday. Um, we thoroughly enjoyed our visit there, the entertainment was superb. And what was unbelievable was the extremely reasonable cost of our trip. Um, London, to, uh, Las Vegas to London, where I picked Rose up, uh, then on to Tabor Heights, our excursion, <laughs> not literally, uh, our excursions to Cairo and Giza, to Petra and St. Catharines. The total cost uh, will amaze you. Um, $2,728, that's $136 a night, which is flight, accommodation, taxes, and everything. So, wow, wow, my word. person. Quite remarkable. Um, very quickly, the Magic Kingdom. Um, we are moving in the antique uh, business from Las Vegas. Uh, I, I, I'm reluctant to call it an antique mall. Um, I have pieces of archaeological uh, memorabilia and uh, breccia uh, that date back 125,000 years. You can hardly call that an antique. Uh, most of my dealers have what we call collectibles. So it's more a collectibles uh, exhibit than it is a, an antique mall. Um, we do have, uh, we had a number of booths available. I'm delighted to say they've all been taken. Uh, we are also putting in, beside it, in what was the old spa, um, a uh, art gallery and an art center. Uh, we've had a number of spaces to make available to local artists, and I'm delighted to say they're all taken. I think there's one space left. Um, in addition to the uh, antique and collectibles, uh, the art gallery and the artists, we also, of course, have the stage area that was uh, uh, remaining in the building, and we will be presenting various fundraising activities <coughs> on that stage. Um, I uh, have run for a number of years a, uh, a game show called Count the Cash. We ran it in Las Vegas at the Clarion Hotel until they knocked it down uh, just over a year ago. Uh, and there, the funds that we generated went to St. Jude's um, Home for Children out at Boulder. Um, we are yet to select a local for our charity, but I've got a feeling right now it's going to be food for thought, uh, which is where my, my main interest lies with uh, children's charities. Um, uh, in conclusion, if you uh, are uh, interested in a, in a good mystery, and fascinated with the Shroud of Turin, may I recommend my latest book, which is called The Maltese Shroud. It's on Amazon. Uh, you can get it as a Kindle book for $2.99, or you can buy the paperback, which is, I think you'll enjoy, fully illustrated and, and uh, has all the details on the shroud in it, uh, and uh, a lot of <coughs> lovely information on Malta. So uh, without that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your time and your consideration today, and I hope you've enjoyed it. A very limited number of questions. <laughs> Do we have questions for Dr. Shield? When will that be opening? Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, opening, I originally planned for my birthday, which was last week, on 15th of October. However, um, we ran into a problem with your local planning department. Which no, no. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Funny thing. And uh, they temporarily shut us down. So uh, we have uh, launched an appeal, which is to be heard, I believe, on the 15th of next month. Any of you who have any influence in that area, it would be deeply appreciated. But uh, their requirement was for 26 parking spaces. Uh, paved parking spaces. Well, even at our maximum capacity, we're not going to have 26 cars parked outside. So it really is quite ridiculous. But anyway, we have applied, and uh, I was hoping Bush was going to be here today. Uh, commissioner. I was going to mention, is that why Bush was coming? Yes, it is. Yes, he's been, he's been asking, most supportive. I talked to him this morning, and he said he wanted to be here. Yes, I know. Thank you. Uh, no, Butch has been most supportive, as have uh, as John, uh, your commissioners, and uh, Everyone has been most supportive, so I, I'm fully anticipating that we'll get our approval on the 15th uh, of uh, November, and uh, that would probably uh, give us a, a, an opening gate of the 1st of, uh, of December. Oh. Are you going to be full of the I'm sorry? 
Oh, uh, Matt, you have a question? <laughs> that same question. <laughs> well, thank you both very, all very much. <clears throat> um, we want to thank you for coming to speak for our class. That was really very interesting and enjoyable. I should do what we do, um, rather than give you a, a, a thank you gift, like a mug or a mouse pad or something, we want to donate a book to the children's um, section of the library in oh, your name. Oh, so if you would mind um, just taking and uh, signing your name somewhere. I just hope it's my book. It's a children's book. Well, let's let's children, just sign your name. Thank you. And we'll... Um, <clears throat> include that in, in uh, my book pleasure. there. Thank, Thank you, you so much. very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank Shield. you all. Thank you. Thank you. Number one, I, I'm going to pass around this sign-up sheet for the uh, blood drive this weekend. If anybody wants to volunteer to work a shift, there are our shifts. All you do is work the registration desk. It's real simple. Just check people in. And, it's not real hard work. Yeah, just visit with them while they're waiting. So I'll pass that around. Um, you know, because of the cash extravaganza, I really haven't had a lot of time to focus on this. But I talked to Nancy at the Blood Center uh, yesterday, and we've got 30 appointments on Friday. We've got 14, plus I got a couple this morning, so we've got 16. But she's asking if we'd be willing to make some calls. Um, I've got a calling list here. If anybody wants to take a, a sheet and do some calling to try to dig up some people, they are going to send out a, a blast email today to uh, oh, for, for getting donors to donate. How would that work if, if we take the sheets home and, and we sign somebody up for a specific time period? How are we going to be? Well,